Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to get going. Uh, we want to go through all of these muscles. Uh, we left off uh, with this image here, or this illustration. And so I want to go through uh, just a handful of the basic muscles. Again, there are over 600 muscles of varying shapes, sizes, uh, actions. Uh, so, and in fact, we're still discovering new skeletal muscles, believe it or not. Uh, so anyway, we just discovered a couple really tiny ones at the base of the occipital bone uh, probably about 10 years ago. And, uh, but anyway, we are only concerned with maybe, oh, I don't know, 30 muscles at the most, maybe the most clinically relevant uh, muscles uh, that any of you would see regardless of what uh, area uh, or branch of the medical industry you go into. Some of these you're gonna, you'll be giving shots. So you'll be giving intramuscular shots. And a lot of times those shots are gonna be given uh, in one of two or three different muscles. Uh, you'll learn uh, in your clinicals uh, and some of your other courses that we have uh, subcutaneous uh, shots. Like a, some of you, maybe all of you have had, had a TB test where they did a little bit of an injection uh, just underneath uh, uh, the skin. So, um, so anyhow, anyhow we'll, uh, I'll make note to, and uh, we'll discuss. I'm sure all of you have had a shot at some point. Uh, that tetanus shot up here in the, in the shoulder area, uh, for instance, is one that uh, I'm sure all of you have experienced. So, so anyhow, we'll go through some of the, the basic uh, names. We'll talk a little bit about the origins and the insertions, uh, and certainly a little bit about the actions. Uh, but primarily, uh, and, and you'll do some of that with your uh, visible body lab and portfolio assignment. Uh, there's, I think, about nine or so uh, of these muscles where you need to put in the origin bone, uh, the insertion bone, and the action. Next Tuesday, um, I'll check back when we check in. I, I'll open with uh, discussing the visible body uh, portfolio uh, assignment for this unit. Um, and so if, so between now and Tuesday, try to, uh, get a little bit of a head start. It, it's not due till the following Tuesday, but, um, but I do want to go through a couple of those items with you next week and, uh, just kind of check in, make sure that you're on the right track with some of your muscle identification, as well as some of the origins, insertions, and actions. Um, and then next week we're starting in uh, to the next unit. So uh, we'll be doing uh, unit uh, seven uh, next, starting next week. So um, I believe, or man, maybe it's unit eight. I don't know. I lose track. There's uh, unit seven, I believe. We're going to probably get into um, either the nervous system or the endocrine system. I haven't decided yet. Um, so either way, that's what's coming up. Uh, some of you have started to deposit your uh, Unit 5 labs, visible body, uh, portfolio combo assignments into the Dropbox. So I think I've got about maybe 11 or 12 total. So that's good. Uh, we went from 3 to 12 just in a, a matter of a couple of days. So keep those coming in. I probably am going to start grading those. Uh, on either Sunday or Monday. So try to have those in this weekend, uh, those Unit 5 uh, assignments. So let's get to it. We see a, an overview of these first couple slides of uh, the anterior view. And again, notice that uh, our model is in correct anatomical position. Uh, arms to the side, palms facing forward, thumbs uh, out uh, laterally. Uh, and again, we're looking at what we call the superficial muscles. You can see uh, this little area we've cut out uh, a little bit of fascia, so you can see uh, the underlying musculature of the abdominal group. But for the most part, these are the superficial muscles uh, of the anterior uh, body. You can uh, go down your list and, and mark several of these off uh, regarding uh, what you need to be able to identify. So. 
What we're going to spend time on uh, is not looking at the whole picture. We're going to break down uh, each of these areas and look at the musculature that way. But these slides are here for you to refer to if you need them. <clears throat> Both videos from uh, Tuesday should appear now uh, in the uh, folders for uh, weekly Zoom sessions. So, uh, so anyway, you wanna refer to those as well, especially if you're still uh, working on uh, your skeletal system portfolio. We went through some of the bone identifications on Tuesday. Okay, so anyway, here's a posterior view, again, looking at uh, the superficial uh, posterior muscles. We can also notice a couple of things. Uh, we see the directions of these fibers are, are going in multiple, uh, they're in the fiber direction is going a million different ways here. And the fiber direction, remember the fibers are the cellular portion. They're like the puppet strings that when we contract, uh, we get some sort of movement. So the fiber direction really determines the direction of movement uh, at the joint. So we can see, for instance, with the gluteus maximus fiber direction, all going in kind of an oblique uh, fashion kind of an angular fashion. And we also see it's a very broad muscle. Uh, we've got a broad origin and a broad insertion site over here. So this tells us one thing that this muscle is gonna perform uh, several different actions. The smaller the muscle, uh, likely we're gonna see the fewer actions. So, um, so we come up here to uh, the infraspinatus, uh, one of the rotator cuff muscles. And again, very tiny muscle, very important muscle. But again, you can't really see the fiber directions. They're going to go kind of in this, uh, this uh, oblique manner as well. Uh, so they're going to perform uh, some sort of action that's going to bring uh, whatever it's inserted to uh, toward a posterior direction. So most of these muscles are gonna perform posterior uh, actions. And when we looked at this one, we see the anterior muscles, they're gonna perform more anterior actions of flexion. And then we have a lateral view uh, as well. We can see, uh, again, several of the, of the uh, different fiber directions and all of these superficial muscles. So let's get to it uh, and start in on the important skeletal muscles uh, of the uh, face. We're gonna start uh, with the axial skeletal muscles. So this first uh, group is gonna focus primarily on muscles uh, of the skull, vertebral column, and ribs. Because you'll recall when we did the axial skeleton uh, last week, we focused on the week before, we focused on skull, vertebral column, uh, and then the ribs, and of course the sternum. So this first batch of muscles will focus on the axial uh, muscular group. Okay, so our first batch, we've got uh, a couple of important muscles that uh, move the various parts of the head as well as the skin. We see this first batch here on top of the, the uh, parietal as well as the frontal and occipital bone. Uh, bones. One thing we'll notice as we go, remember we name muscles based oftentimes on the bones that they're associated with. So we do see uh, this muscle called the frontalis muscle, the frontal portion. We see this posterior muscle called the occipitalis muscle. When we combine them, they call it the occipital frontalis. You'll notice IS on a lot of uh, our muscles as we go. IS and US are common uh, end letters for muscles. Okay. So together they call this the epicranius or epicranial muscle. We also see a new term here. We kind of glossed over it. I mentioned it uh, briefly on Tuesday. Aponeurosis or aponeurosis. This is going to be a tendinous sheath that's, uh, in essence, it's going to bring two separate muscles together. So as opposed to having uh, a muscle connect to a bone and then another bone via a tendon, right? So you have a muscle and then a tendon connects to a bone and then another tendon to a, a different bone. With an aponeurosis or an aponeurosis, we get a muscle and a muscle separate from each other and those muscles are connected by some sort of a tendinous sheath. So it does have a different name. We see it a few times through 
throughout uh, the chapter. This is probably the most well-known or the most common uh, ap aponeurosis that we do see. So anyway, this is the epicranius muscle, which is actually a group of two, frontalis, occipitalis. And then we go to the temporal bone and we see a muscle called the temporalis muscle. And again, uh, the name of the muscle tells us uh, where it's located. It's going to be on the temporal bone. That particular muscle originates on the temporal bone and inserts all the way down on the mandible. It kind of disappears under uh, the zygomatic uh, arch. So uh, we do see this temporal temporalis muscle. And we'll, I have another in, illustration of it soon uh, where we will see where it actually inserts all the way down on the mandible. So the temporalis action is going to help with elevating uh, the mandible. Oh, and by the way, the, the uh, frontalis muscle, for instance, is going to elevate uh, the eyebrows, wrinkle the forehead. So any type of action that we see with the forehead is going to primarily be created by that uh, epicranius or frontalis muscle. Okay. Uh, the temporalis oftentimes too, so this going back to temporalis, that's oftentimes a muscle that has a lot of tension that we, we'll see uh, patients that have tension headaches. We see patients who have TMJ disorders. Uh, this could be some sort of a trigger point or some sort of uh, muscular issue going on with the temporalis. Okay, and then we've got a couple more to look at on this particular slide. We have what's called the masseter muscle. This particular muscle uh, is going to be located uh, along the uh, uh, kind of the ramus or the edge of the uh, mandible. And then it's going to come up. You can kind of see it disappear under the zygomatic bone and kind of plugs into the maxilla. So the masseter is also going to help with elevating the mandible. Remember, the insertion is the movable part. So if the insertion is here and the origin is up here, action is insertion being uh, pulled or moving the muscle toward the origin. Same with the temporalis. The origin is up here. The insertion is down here. Movement or action occurs when insertion moves toward origin. So masseter and temporalis are two big muscles when it comes to chewing and closing uh, of the mouth. There's another one kind of hidden uh, underneath the masseter a little bit. This is the bugler uh, muscle. Bugler uh, is known as the buccinator, uh, and that helps with puckering the lips, like if you're uh, tooting a horn or a bugle. So puckering of the lips along the edge there, that's going to be the buccal. They, and, and the buccal region is, is kind of this part of the cheek. We think of the zygomatic as the cheekbone, but the buccal portion uh, is going to have to do with kind of the cheeks as they're associated with the mouth. So going all the way back to week one, you may recall uh, seeing that word buccal at some point, B-U-C-C-A-L, having to do with uh, the cheeks, uh, particularly of the mouth. Okay. So masseter, buccinator, temporalis, those all do a lot of work <clears throat> with the mouth and the, and the, the jaw uh, or mandible. A couple others, we've got this little uh, zygomaticus. Oh, and by the way, too, masseter and buccinator. Masseter uh, has to do, the name of the muscle has to do with the action of the muscle. What just we saw with temporalis and occipitalis frontalis, the name of the muscle has to do with where it's located. With masseter, the name of the muscle has more to do with the action of the muscle, which would be mastication careful with that one, right? Mastication with a T, uh, mastication means to chew. So the masseter performs mastication. Uh, buccinator, that one's named for uh, sort of the action of the muscle. A buccinator has to do with, the, with a bugling uh, effect or, or you know, puckering of the cheeks and the lips. So sort of an action one as well. And then again, we see these two zygomaticus muscles. Uh, they're going to help with, uh, again, kind of smiling or pulling uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, lip area up a little bit. You can see the origin of the zygomatic. It's going to be on the zygomatic bone. Insertion is going to be down here uh, around the uh, lip area, around the orbicularis oris, they call it. Orbit uh, means round. 
uh, and orus means mouth. So this is a round sphincter muscle around uh, the mouth, and that's where that zygomatic kind of plugs in. Then we have another sphincter muscle, the orbit of the eye. We see orbicularis. Orbicularis, that has to do with the shape of the muscle. And then oculi and oris, those tell us where the muscle's located. Ocular, of course, having to do with the eyes, and oris having to do with oral or the mouth. So again, we've got quite an assortment, uh, a very good representation of muscle naming and, and uh, a little bit of a, of a variety there. We've got another one here uh, that we're going to see sh shortly in a, in a little more detail. It's a major muscle of moving uh, the head primarily uh, when we see uh, bringing the chin down but we also can get some uh, lateral rotation uh, with this muscle and even a little bit of lateral uh, flexion. Uh, it's, called, it's a long name. It's probably the longest or one of the longer muscle names that we'll see, sternocleidomastoid. It's one word. It's, it's got the hyphen there. So you know, it would come all the way out here. And it's one we've mentioned before, but it, it, if we break it down, it tells us a little bit about location of the muscle. Sterno means sternum, so down around the sternal area. And then uh, clido means clavicle. So you have the sternum and the clavicle. Okay. And you can even see a ligament that kind of, or a tendon that kind of comes down in that area. Okay. And that muscle is going to travel up and plug behind the ear in what we call the mastoid process. So you'll recall when we did uh, the skeletal system, we looked at the mastoid process just behind the earlobe area, that bump, uh, bony bump behind the ear. So this particular muscle, sternocleidomastoid, tells us everything we need to know about it. We've got uh, the origin uh, site, the sternocleido, the sternum and clavicle. We call that the SC joint, sternoclavicular joint. And then the mastoid, again, tells us uh, the insertion site. And remember, origin and insertion uh, meet up. Insertion is actually going to come down toward, uh, depending on those fiber directions, uh, the insertion is going to move toward the origin, regardless of fiber direction. With this particular muscle, we do see uh, fiber directions going this way, fiber directions going this way. If we bilaterally or if we... Uh, shorten or contract both sternocleidomastoids it's again like puppet strings we can we we anchor the puppet string here we run the movable part of the string there and we pull on the puppet string it's going to create this type of action i can unilaterally pull on uh, the sternocleidomastoid maybe i just want to uh, pull on this uh, right side uh, puppet string or scm so if i pull that it's going to turn my head to the left if I just pull this one, it's going to turn my head uh, to the right. So the left SCM gets you a little bit of right side rotation. Left side, or right side gets you left side rotation. If you do the both, uh, both SCMs, you're going to get uh, the chin going down to the uh, sternum. So that's a big muscle. That's a major muscle. Right behind it, uh, or just deep to it, you're going to find uh, the carotid artery. And this is a site where this little triangle right in here uh, is a site that uh, we uh, palpate for a, a carotid pulse. So uh, you can kind of see that triangle. It, it runs along the, the edge uh, of the, the ramus and the border uh, of the mandible. And it comes down uh, kind of along the trachea. And then we have uh, the last edge of that triangle, the last side of that triangle being the uh, anterior portion of the SCM. So we do abbreviate sternocleidomastoid, SCM. But you can see this little triangular area right in here. This is where we palpate for the carotid pulse. Okay, so keep that in mind as well. All right, so let's keep her moving. Uh, just the same muscles, different uh, viewpoint, more of an anterior view. We see the frontalis, orbicularis uh, oculi, orbicularis oris. We can see the zygomaticus uh, coming down, uh, again, and kind of plugging in there. So this insertion point of the zygomatic muscle is gonna kind of pull the lips up, uh, uh, do the elvis uh, with one of those.
Okay, masseter, again, uh, for chewing, buccinator for bugling. Next little area, I'm not gonna spend much of any time here. There aren't any muscles that uh, I'm gonna quiz you on, uh, but I do just wanna show you, uh, once again, we have that styloid process coming off uh, of the temporal bone. Okay, and then we have the hyoid bone here. And again, we can see uh, how uh, that area and the, and the throat region right around the vocal cords, which is here, the larynx, you can see that, the voice box, the hyoid just uh, superior to it, we're gonna see again uh, a little bit of ligament and a lot of muscle for moving the tongue, chewing, swallowing, those types of things. You don't need to know anything really on this slide. Okay, next one, we've looked at these again. I wanted to put this on here because it does remove all of that other musculature so we can see uh, just the temporalis really and how broad of an origin it is and how it uh, converges into one little tiny insertion spot uh, on the mandible. So again, a very powerful muscle uh, creating very direct uh, uh, action on this one spot. So, um, and again, the bigger this muscle is, depending on the animal, notice it goes underneath that zygomatic arch. So we do see animals that, that have a lot of chomping power have a, a very large zygomatic arch to again accommodate uh, for that uh, muscle size that uh, again is required to be able to you know break bone open like we see cats eat bone marrow the big cats uh, alligators certainly have large uh, zygomatic arches for chomping uh, and getting into uh, creating a lot of force uh, with that chop. So you need a lot of muscle to create a lot of force. Let's go to the posterior area of the uh, upper uh, back and neck area. We see the most superficial muscle uh, of the upper back called the trapezius. You've probably all heard of that at some point. Notice it's not over here. That's simply because we removed it so you could see the muscles underneath the trapezius. You do have one complete uh, muscle. It, it would actually form a, a trapezius shape or almost like a diamond shape or a kite shape. Um, the trapezius notice has a lot of fiber directions. It's going to create a lot of movement. This whole area all the way up along the kind of the occipital uh, area, we call this the nuchal uh, spot, uh, kind of that ridge along the back of the head, that's where a, a big chunk of this trapezius is gonna plug in. And then we see it continue to originate uh, all along uh, the spinous processes uh, of the uh, cervical and into the thoracic vertebrae. So that's got a really big origin. And then again, it all converges uh, really to this uh, spine of the scapula. So uh, the movement, uh, so if I pull this puppet string up here, this area uh, of the, uh, the spine of the scapula, including the whole scapula, is going to elevate. So the trapezius can elevate the scapulae. They can also help to kind of uh, adduct a little bit or kind of bring the scapulae uh, toward the vertebral column. And then if we activate these trapezius, we, get, we can actually pull uh, uh, or depress uh, the scapula a little bit. So this, the uh, trapezius has a lot of different actions to it. Okay. Okay, when we peel a, a away, we can see a couple other big muscles uh, underneath it. We see this group here. They're not labeled. They're called the rhomboids group. We'll see those uh, in a little while, but we can see uh, those kind of plug in or originate on the uh, thoracic vertebrae and come down onto that medial border of the scapula. And so again, puppet strings coming down to the insertion, shortening those puppet strings and pulling the bone toward the origin would get adduction of uh, the scapulae with add, meaning bringing them toward the midline. So bringing your shoulders back is going to be this group, uh, the rhomboids. And we'll see those again a little bit later. This is called splenius capitis. I don't quiz you on that one. Uh, splenius means splint. Uh, capitus means head, so it's basically a head splint. 
um, again, originating down here on the lower cervicals and upper thoracics and inserting uh, up along uh, the nuchal lines of the, uh, of the occipital bone. So again, it's going to kind of keep your head uh, splinted or your head back. So this muscle gets overstretched when we're doing this too much. And what uh, that overstretching does is it puts stress on the origin site. So we're gonna, uh, if we go the opposite direction, remember if we're doing the opposite action, uh, so if the action is this, uh, it's gonna shorten the fibers. If we go this way, it lengthens the fibers. And so the way muscles and bones work, if we stretch uh, the muscle, it te the tendency is for the bone at the origin site to kind of come with it. So this, as I move my head forward, uh, this little spot, which you know, there's like a little hump there, right? That's where the C7 and the T1 begin. So you get kind of a little uh, posterior hump and that hump can get really big uh, because it, remember bone will accommodate uh, to extra stress that's placed on it. So if I'm doing this all of the time, uh, the bone is the that area of my vertebral columns also going to try to come with it to kind of accommodate that extra stress and it could lead to some bony uh, spurs or uh, just general uh, inflammation soreness swelling um, I mean, we've had patients come in, you, you know, that little hump, you, it's practically like a shelf. You could, you know, set a saucer and a, a teacup on that, uh, that shelf back there. So again, we need to get them uh, going in a, in a, a posterior direction and re-energize re uh, some of the, uh, the insertion sites and kind of calm down the origin sites. Okay, so some tr a couple of trunk muscles. So those are the main muscles of the head, the neck, um, the vertebral column. We'll see a few others, uh, but several of the uh, ax uh, or the appendicular uh, muscles that we're going to do in a few minutes, they do anchor on parts of the uh, axial skeleton. Um, but anyway, a couple muscles of staying in the axial portion of the, uh, primarily now of the thorax or the, uh, the rib cage, we do see what are called intercostal muscles. We have uh, external intercostals with a fiber direction uh, going uh, a little bit more in a, in a north-south uh, manner, an up-down manner. And then the inter, so these are going to be more superficial. Inter, remember, means between. Costal has to do with that, that uh, with the ribs and that costal cartilage that we see. So between the ribs, ex externally, uh, it doesn't mean outside the body. It just means relative uh, to uh, what's underneath or more internal. They could call them superficial intercostals and deep intercostals. That would also work, but instead they went with external and internal. Um, uh, Basically, what we have is uh, one group is going to elevate the, the ribs and the other group is going to depress the ribs. So we see both of these working. Uh, when we get to the respiratory system, we'll visit these again and look at a little more detail of their action uh, or their actions. The diaphragm is a, we've seen that before when we did body cavities, right? We saw the uh, thoracic cavity separated from the abdominal cavity and that diaphragm forms a complete wall between those two cavities. Of course, we do have a couple of, of pathways to, to, for the esophagus to uh, travel down into the stomach. And we, we also need to get blood flow uh, down to the uh, uh, inferior of the diaphragm. We need to get blood back up to the heart and lungs from uh, the inferior aspects uh, of the body. So we do have uh, some pathways that puncture through the diaphragm, but uh, the, it's still enclosed and we shouldn't see any uh, abdominal fluid seeping into uh, the thoracic uh, area, nor should we see thoracic or pleural fluid uh, leaching or seeping down into uh, the abdominal area. That is a complete wall. It's a very thick muscle, and uh, it's got its origins way down here on the anterior aspects of the body of the lumbar vertebrae. And uh, 
the insertions are going to be up uh, around the rib area. And so when I shorten this muscle, it actually flattens out. And uh, we're going to see in respiration that the lungs are actually attached to the diaphragm or, or lung tissue, uh, the pleura. So when we pull the diaphragm down, it actually uh, increases the volume uh, of the lungs. So the lungs get bigger is what that means. So when the diaphragm flattens out, the lungs go with it and uh, they expand in volume. And that increase in volume causes a decrease in pressure. And so the pressure outside is, becomes higher than the pressure inside and air moves from high pressure to low pressure. So the diaphragm is a major muscle of, of, of our ability, enabling our ability to inhale. So if we can't uh, bring in oxygen in, that's a big problem, we know that. So the diaphragm does uh, three quarters of the work uh, that is needed to encourage uh, inhalation and inspiration to, uh, to happen. Okay, a couple of other muscles, and then we'll, we'll move into uh, the appendicular area, but we do have a couple of muscles to look at still uh, on the axial portion. We have this large pectoralis major muscle that has a, a broad origin all the way up here on the clavicle, primarily the pectoralis pectoralis major origin is going to be on the sternum and then it's going to have an insertion point all the way out here kind of in the armpit area on the humerus. So again the insertion being out here we pull the string it's going to bring uh, the, the shoulder bring the whole arm uh, inward so we could see some inward rotation or internal rotation we can see uh, some horizontal flexion uh, as well with that pectoralis major. Okay, if we take the pectoralis major off, we go underneath it, we'll see in a little while we've got what's called a pectoralis minor that's going to be kind of plugged in right here on the ribs, and then it's going to plug up onto the uh, coracoid process that we looked at last week uh, on the scapula, that little uh, kind of knobby bump that's a little bit sensitive right underneath uh, or uh, inferior to the clavicle. So anyway, pectoralis major, uh, you want to take a look at that. We'll see it again in a little while. We do have the abdominal group uh, primarily down the middle here going up and down. We have what's called the rectus abdominis. And remember, rectus means erect or up and down. So we do see the muscle fiber direction going up and down. And then uh, we, do, we will see in a little while what are called the obliques. You can see the external oblique tells us the fiber direction, and then oblique means angled, and then underneath the external oblique is what we call the internal oblique. It's slightly different fiber direction than the external obliques. And then deep to that, we find the transverse uh, abdominis, and again, transverse, implying that we're gonna see fiber direction that's gonna be more horizontal or transverse. So anyway, there's a lot of action going on, certainly with the anterior abdominal group. Those four muscles of the abdominal group that we went through uh, are right here. You'll go through these when you do your visible body activities as well. And bacon uh, is the abdominal, uh, four abdominal muscles uh, of the pig. So again, the fattier the bacon, if there's a lot of white in between here, that pig probably sat around and didn't do much. Uh, uh, so sometimes fatty bacon is really good, right? For flavoring soups and flavoring dishes, uh, fat carries a lot of flavor with it. If we're going after the bacon for the protein uh, aspect, then you, you want to make sure you have a lot of red uh, at the, you know, when you're buying your bacon. And uh, again, that means that Pig was probably a little more active. Uh, he did uh, worked on his six pack abs and uh, the uh, I don't know ab lounger or whatever it was uh, uh, back in the uh, the infomercial days. So, but anyway, uh, free range pigs are going to have more uh, more protein and more red. Uh, sit around do nothing. Pigs are going to have uh, a lot of uh, uh, fat to their uh, abdominal group. Okay, and 
Again, muscles of the back, we looked at some of these already. We're still on the axial aspect, so we're going to stick uh, to that trapezius muscle along the vertebral column. And then we see another one if we go a little further down or a little more inferior. The, we have kind of like an upper back cape, the trapezius. Then we have kind of a middle and lower back cape uh, called the latissimus dorsi. Dorsi, of course, means dorsal. Okay, and we can see uh, the latissimus muscle uh, with fiber directions uh, heading up into the armpit, just about the same area where we find the pectoralis muscle uh, inserting. So uh, the pectoralis muscle inserts on the humerus, the, uh, the proximal medial humerus, the latissimus muscle also comes up and inserts in a similar area. So pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi are antagonists of one another. So when pectoralis major mm -hmm. does this with the shoulder uh, and the arm, uh, in order to get my arm back here, the latissimus dorsi does a lot of that action. Okay, So like your rowing action is going to be uh, pectoralis major and then latissimus dorsi back and forth. Okay. Again, you know, if we saw last, last time we were together on Tuesday, the prime mover or the agonist performs the action, uh, and at the same time, the antagonist muscle is lengthening. Uh, when I want to perform the opposite action, the antagonist now becomes the prime mover, okay? and the uh, prime mover becomes the antagonist. So the prime mover uh, is no longer shortening, it's now lengthening or stretching back out to put us back into uh, where we started. All right, so anyway, we looked at the rhomboids a little bit, okay, plugging in uh, onto the, the, on the thoracic, uh, upper thoracic and middle thoracic, and then inserting uh, along the lateral or the medial border uh, of the scapula. So again, movement is going to occur here, and it's going to bring the scapula closer to the midline which we call adduction. Now we've got uh, four uh, rotator cuffs. We can see three of them. We're gonna get into these in a little, in a little while. Uh, these are technically considered appendicular muscles, but uh, when we remove the trapezius, we do get a really good look on this slide of these rotator cuff muscles. Okay, so we will see these in more detail shortly, but this is a pretty good shot of them too, at least three of them. We have S, I, and T, little t right here. We have two T's, but the big T, Terry's major, is not a rotator cuff. The Terry's minor is. Remember, some muscles are major, minor. We saw it with pectoralis. Minor just means it's smaller. Okay. So S, I, T, sit. Those are the first three rotator cuff muscles. And what the rotator cuff muscles do is help with rotation of the shoulder. Okay. So we see three of them are in the back. So three of them are going to create rotation this way. And then the fourth one is actually underneath the scapula, and it's going to create rotation back forward. So we have SIT, sit. And then on the underside of the scapula, which we'll see shortly, is another S. So the four rotators are S-I-T-S, -S, sits. Okay. All right, let's keep the ball rolling here. Oh, lastly, just making mention, there's a lot of muscles here, but we only won't really know them as one big group. If we, if we remove all of this tissue here, you can kind of see a little bit of them right here. But if we remove trapezius and latissimus, uh, we can see all of this muscle uh, underneath. And that's going to be called the erector spinae. So again, it's going to keep the spine erect. And name of the muscle. And then again, it's a group. We just want to know them as a group. Erector spinae, simply put, name of the muscle tells you what it does. So if we, uh, if we, we were asked, what is the action of the erector spinae muscle group? Okay. Keeping the spine erect, okay. extension of the spine, okay. flexion is this way of the, of the vertebral column. That's going to be performed by the abdominal group. Extension of the spine 
performed by the erector spinae. Again, getting your back uh, erect again, or your spine erect. Okay. And so these are postural muscles as well. So when we have patients who have poor posture, again, we want to start to, they have set points that have been established that don't involve much action from the erector spinae group. So we do want to encourage uh, a little bit of postural uh, awareness and, and hopefully uh, we can start to establish a, a new set point that is a healthier set point and, and a set point that activates and energizes those postural muscles. There are so many, right? I mean, every single one of these muscles uh, of the back is gonna be responsible for posture in some degree, uh, or to some degree, to a, to a great degree, actually. Um, and again, when we look at the front, these are the antagonists of all of these back muscles. And so if the back muscles are not doing much, the front muscles are doing a lot of the work. So a lot of us nowadays are driving on their tablets, sitting at a desk, sitting in a, you know, whatever it is, everything is in here. So again, we're starting to see more and more issues uh, with posture and furthermore with blood flow and nerve flow that leaves uh, and comes back to uh, the spinal cord. So, uh, so anyway, posture, very important uh, to keep uh, aware of. All right, appendicular muscles. We'll see a few that we just did uh, again and as part of the appendicular. And again, with appendicular, we're dealing with arms and legs. We know that. You knew that before you took anatomy, right? Uh, the, an appendage was an arm or a leg. Um, well, if you didn't, you know that now. But we do go a step further with the arm and leg idea with appendicular. We want to remember that this, the shoulder girdle with the clavicles and the scapulae are also part of the upper uh, appendages. We also want to remember that the hip girdle or the pelvic girdle uh, is also part of the lower extremities or the appendicular skeleton. So Again, keep that in mind. We're going to focus on the upper extremity muscles. We've already seen trapezius a little bit. The reason we see it again is because it, 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 a couple of these and I have, have a dual uh, axial appendicular uh, attachment. So we see again that the trapezius does have its origin attachment on the axial skeleton. So in that way, it's an axial muscle, but its insertion is out here on an appendicular aspect, which is the scapula. So, um, so anyway, I put them in both. I put the trapezius in both spots. Same with the rhomboids. You just need to know the rhomboids as a group. You don't need to necessarily know minor versus major. Uh, the rhomboids are just deep or underneath the trapezius muscle. And again, they have an origin on the vertebral column and an insertion out here on the medial border of the scapula. So they're going to move toward uh, the vertebral column, they meaning the scapulae. Okay. We also have another uh, muscle we haven't seen yet called levator scapulae. This one's more or less an FYI. I don't think I test you or quiz you on this one. But uh, again, the name, if I did, it'd just be something to do with the name of the muscle and what it relates to. We see levator meaning to elevate or to lift, and then we see the word scapulae. So elevates the scapula. That's all that that means. So that means when we have a muscle that is named for the action of the muscle, like this one, levator scapulae, elevates the scapula, we can uh, safely assume that uh, the insertion is also given to us in the name of the muscle. Levator scapulae tells us the action, elevates the scapula. Remember the, remember, the insertion is the movable part. The action just told us the movable part. It's the scapula. So the insertion for the levator scapulae is going to be the scapula. Okay, and you can be really specific and say, you know, the superior border, the, the medial portion of the superior border of the scapula. You, you don't need to get that deep. Uh, just again, you're, you guys are just learning new terminology, getting your feet wet and, and understanding that you don't have to memorize a whole bunch of stuff. You can uh, see 
through repetition, the naming makes sense. And as you get more acclimated to the naming and the medical terminology, you can have a greater understanding of a lot of things that are going on without having to just memorize this equals this. Okay. It's just, again, repetition, levator scapula or scapulae tells us that we're elevating the scapula. So, so the muscle name is levator scapula. The origin, we're not sure yet. We can look at that. Insertion and action, we do know those just by the name. Okay, I think you guys see where I'm going here with this or where I've been going. I don't want to beat a dead horse. Okay, so levator scapulae elevates the scapula. So the movable part is the scapula. So that's the insertion. And remember, the movable part is going to, or, or the muscle action means the movable part or the insertion goes towards the origin. So we would see the origin somewhere up underneath uh, the splenius capitis heading uh, up to those upper cervical vertebrae. Okay, some, some of you uh, have, you have maybe some big knots or balls kind of right up in that area of your scap. Okay, so a lot of our, a lot of you, a lot of our patients is very normal because of the actions we do from day to day. The scapulae are elevated. Do the trapezius do it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But underneath uh, the levator scaps, they get uh, kind of um, forgotten about a little bit. So these, uh, again, posture, we have to get the shoulders down. We don't want the shoulders up in our ears. That's a defensive uh, position. That's a, a, a fearful kind of position. You want to have confidence and you want those, those levator scaps to be relaxed. You want the trapezius to be relaxed. And then everything kind of falls into place from there. It's like a domino effect. But if you're up, up here all of the time, that's a protective, fearful kind of, of posture. You don't want to present that to your patients. You don't want to present that to your doctors. You want to present confidence, comfort, neutrality, and slight positivity, right? New, neutral to positive. That's where you want to be throughout your life. You don't want to be negative. You don't want to be here. You don't want to be neutral negative where you're kind of here, but kind of here. You want to be neutral to neutral positive. That's what, that's what your patients look for. That's what your family looks for. That's what your physicians are looking for. Uh, we're looking for, for that the body language is everything, right? It's the unspoken regarding what uh, is going on up here. It tells us everything. So keep that in mind as well as you're dealing with your patients, right? Patients like to eh, maybe over uh, emphasize things. Some patients like to under emphasize things. So um, short of running a bunch of tests to see if they're telling us the whole story, sometimes we can tell by their body language. We can tell by their tone. We can tell by their by the vibration that, that just kind of is coming off of them, that they have some pain. That pain may be more than what they're telling us. Um, they may have less pain than what they're telling us. And they're just there to, uh, because you know, for other reasons, to get pain medication. So uh, that's a big deal nowadays, right? Being able to try to decipher because pain is subjective. So a 10 for you is maybe a one for me. I mean, your 10 could be just to get that, uh, that oxycodone or whatever. So we have to be very diligent in our pain management with our patients and, and understanding body language, understanding uh, the unspoken. So um, again, we're not trying to read into anything too deeply. We're just making general observations and, and charting them and making note of them. Because again, it's, uh, uh, nowadays it's, we're, we're under a lot of scrutiny to be able to, to make sure that we're not getting a lot of repeat visitors. We, we, we do understand that our patients come in with acute issues. We help them to resolve them. Hopefully they're, they're good to go. They come in with an acute issue and we perceive it as a, as a big deal. We're, this is now a chronic condition. Um, we don't treat maybe what we're supposed to. And next thing you know, they're coming into the office again and again and again because we never really dug deep at the front end with maybe what, uh, what was going on here. So uh, insurance, uh, Medicaid, uh, Medicare, uh, whatever it is, the, however they're paying, um, 
those pay payers are being a little bit more uh, strict regarding you know re repeat visits and and are we really getting to the bottom of treating this patient or are they manipulating the system and furthermore is the physician in on it too are they manipulating the system whether it's unwitting or witting there's no more unwitting manipulating of the system because there's a better checks and balances uh, saying no more of this coming in for uh, a sore whatever and we're not treating that. Instead, we're just giving them pain medication as opposed to getting them going on other areas of, of uh of getting that ailment healed. So again, everybody's different. You're going to realize that even the, the individual the, themselves are different from moment to moment possibly. So uh, you guys are, are in for a, a fun and exciting ride. And, and this A&P foundational information, again, is, is truly just to get your feet wet uh, with the, all of this, this terminology that you're going to be bombarded with. But there are other little uh, unspokens that we do need to speak about to uh, the realities of, of working in the clinical setting. So anyway, uh, we've already looked at this. Uh, we peeled away the pec major, and I did, but I did want to show you this uh, pectoralis minor. I, it had been removed earlier, uh, and again, it's going to have its origin on the ribs. It's going to come up onto the scapula, primarily that, that coracoid process. So it's going to bring the scapulae forward uh, a little bit as well. Okay. The other muscle on this page uh, or on this slide that you can see it's listed twice, subscapularis. That's our other rotator cuff muscle. Sub means below or underneath. So below the scap or underneath the scapula. We're saying the anterior portion of the scapula is where the fourth rotator cuff muscle is. And it's going to plug in in the same areas that the other three do, uh, but it's going to be plugging in in a more anterior spot. It's an anterior muscle so it's going to create an anterior action posterior muscles create posterior actions lateral muscles like the deltoid create lateral actions okay um, medial muscles we'll see the the groin muscles the adductor muscles create medial movements so again location of the muscle dictates to you the direction of movement or the action of that muscle. All right, so keep that in mind too as you study muscles. Next up, uh, again, we saw pec major earlier. Uh, we have uh, our first look really at the deltoid. This is a large muscle uh, on the uh, upper shoulder region. It does have its origins uh, all the way across uh, about the, the lateral third of the clavicle and it circles all the way back to uh, around the acromion process and onto the lateral third or so of the spine of the scapula. So that's a very broad uh, origin. Its insertion actually comes down to a little tiny spot uh, about uh, halfway or so, maybe a, a third of the way down uh, distally of the lateral portion uh, of the humerus. There's a tuberosity or a bump out there called the deltoid tuberosity, and that's where that plugs in, and then the fibers just fan out all across uh, to different areas of the clavicle and scapula. So again, the fiber direction tells us a lot about the deltoid, um, just and the fact that it has a very broad origin and a very small insertion. Uh, that tells us we're gonna get quite a bit of movement and it's gonna be very fine movements. And so that's what we can get with this deltoid. We can get uh, anterior uh, motion, um, we can get lateral motion, uh, we can get posterior motion or action. So deltoid fibers are anterior, lateral, and posterior. So that tells us again, so it kind of wraps around the whole shoulder complex. What that tells us is that this muscle is going to create anterior movement, lateral movement, and posterior movement. So again, fiber lo muscle location tells you what a kind of action we're going to get. This is also a hot spot, the deltoid for intramuscular injections. This is where you're going to see uh, like your tetanus shot, for instance. 
We'll also go through sometimes the deltoid or the posterior area, maybe the anterior area, depending on where the arthritis might be. Sometimes a cortisone shot, uh, which goes beyond the muscle and actually gets into the joint uh, of the shoulder. Um, but oftentimes those are, are going to be right around that deltoid area. And part of the reason those, sh those shots, uh, are, especially a tetanus shot, is so sore in the muscle is, is again, it's a... It's it's uh, the, the needle uh, gauge uh, that's usually a uh, smaller gauge, which is a larger size. That's kind of the counterintuitive needle uh, sizes. Larger gauge, smaller needle, smaller gauge, larger needle. So use a fairly small gauge needle for that tetanus shot. And so it does damage some of that muscle tissue. And so that soreness is uh, your body uh, trying to repair it. Okay, um, we're going to bypass these. I'm going to go to this slide. Okay, so we get a lateral view. Uh, we see the deltoid again, a broad origin, small insertion. And then what we see uh, are a couple of the muscles of the upper arm. We're going to see the biceps brachii. That's the more superficial muscle and the larger muscle, the anterior area of the area of the upper arm. And just underneath the biceps, and we saw this a little bit um, when we were last class when we were talking about prime movers, we talked about isotonic uh, uh, and isometric contractions. Uh, one of the muscles, we think of the biceps brachiae as, the, as what bends your elbow, but underneath it or deep to it is a muscle simply called brachialis. And, 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 and remember, you'll recall, brachii means arm. Specifically, we're thinking usually of the upper arm, uh, but generally arm. So brachii means arm. So brachialis just means arm muscle. Biceps brachii uh, means, again, brachii means we have an arm muscle. But biceps means we have bi, meaning two, sep, comes from our word uh, cap or head, cephalic. So biceps means two heads. Specifically, it's re referring to the origin heads or the anchor heads uh, of that biceps muscle. So anyway, biceps brachii. On top, underneath it or deep to it is the brachialis. Then we get to the humerus. The posterior arm is going to be... Whoa, it's going to be the triceps brachii. So we'll see the triceps brachii. First of all, brachii meaning arm. Triceps means it has three heads. So we're going to see three origin heads of the triceps. Okay. And the triceps actually plugs into the olecranon process or plugs into your elbow. So there's a little tendon right here that comes off of the triceps muscles. So when the triceps contract, it brings your forearm out or extends your forearm. Okay, so again, we can see just the, the anterior view, just the biceps brachii. Don't worry about coracobrachialis. Again, the name though tells us a lot about it. Corico, you learned a, about the coracoid process. And then brachialis must mean it has to do with the arm. So coracobrachialis says we're anchored at the coracoid process and we're inserted on the brachium or the arm. Again, don't worry about it. We're not going to do that one. Pronator teres, don't worry about that one either. You may see it a few times as you go through some of your identification, but um, pronator has to do with a, an action. And we talked about pronation and supination last week. So pronate means to put your palm down. Okay, so the pronator teres uh, is going to uh, create this action, pronation. And remember, the radius does this action. The ulna does this, the radius does this. So the movable part for pronator muscles would definitely be the radius. Okay. Supinator. 
Okay, it's going to bring your arm back out. Again, the radius is going to be uh, the, the movable part of the insertion. I don't think that one's on your list, though, so we're not going to spend much time on it. Triceps, brachia. Again, now we're looking at the posterior upper arm. We see the back of the upper arm, the triceps, the three-headed uh, arm muscle. And again, this is going to do extension of the elbow. It's the antagonist to uh, the biceps brachii. All right, then we come down here, we're back to the anterior view. This time what we did was remove the biceps brachii. So now we're looking at uh, this illustration here. We just cut the biceps uh, and removed it. And now we see the brachialis underneath it. And again, it's gonna plug into the ulna, we're going to get, uh, so we have some synergism going on, right? Uh, with flexion of the elbow, we have to, uh, we have the biceps brachii and the brachialis muscles working together to create elbow flexion. It's kind of, so in the posterior arm, we have the triceps muscle. So it almost seems like you've got like three muscles on the back of the arm on the front of the arm. So you would assume then that the front of the arm would have three muscles as well, or at least three heads, right? We've got three headed muscle back here. Why wouldn't we have a three headed muscle here? Well, we do, we just separate it as two different muscles. Biceps brachii, two heads, and then the brachialis. So there's your kind of your three headed monster on the front of the arm. Does that make sense? I think it probably does. You've got three headed monster here. You should have a three headed monster here. You do. It's just that the three headed monster out front is the uh, biceps brachii plus the brachialis muscle, whereas the posterior uh, upper arm muscle is simply called the triceps brachii. So anyway, this next batch, you just need to know these as a group. There's several of them on there. Um, we're just talking about the forearm. I really just need you to know primarily that the, this group on the front of the forearm, especially on that medial aspect, that's called the flexor group on the forearm. So you can see the word flexor multiple times, right? Flexor, flexor, flexor. So the flexor group is on the anterior portion of the ulna and radius. It flexes the wrist, or they flex the wrist. Okay. There's one other muscle kind of on the anterior forearm, but it's a little bit more lateral. It's a big muscle. It sits out here. Okay. You, it's the kind of the hammer muscle. It's the big muscle that's right on the lateral part of your elbow. They call that the brachio radialis. Again, the name tells us a lot of stuff about it. Brachio tells us arm. Radialis tells us radius. And remember, radius is on the thumb side. It performs this action, okay, some sort of movement, uh, pronation, supination. We also get wrist flexion. Okay. So the brachioradialis is going to be insertion here all the way down to the radius in origin up here on the lateral distal portion of the humerus. So if I pull this string, it's going to get the thumb to do this, to do this action. Okay. So that's going to pop that muscle. Boop, pops it right up. Boop. You can see my, my whole fingers move up just by doing that action. Okay. That's brachioradialis. Just know this, the rest of these as the flexor group. So what's the back of the posterior is going to be the extensor group. So that's what we're going to call uh, the posterior forearm muscles. You can see the word extensor quite a few times. So the extensor group. So just know flexor group, extensor group. Okay. Look at all of those. You don't need to know all those. This one's separated. I would know that brachioradialis. The rest just flexors and extensors. Okay, we're almost done, guys. Uh, um, we are going to move down toward the hip. We've got a double muscle. Actually, it's a triple muscle that oftentimes is referred to as one muscle. And you can see the name of it up here, iliopsoas or iliopsoas. Usually, now, if, if we put a PS 
separate. Like over here, this is the psoas muscle. We don't say psoas, we say psoas muscles. Okay, but if we put an ilio in front of that, then the P gets pronounced. So it's iliop psoas muscle. So anyway, do we do you guys see this? Will you work with this muscle much? Have you ever heard of it? Probably not. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. If you are getting into PTA, I put this one in here because PTAs and orthopedic nurses de will deal with this one quite frequently. Um, the iliacus, so the name of the muscle, tells us a lot about it. It's coming from the ilium, the large portion of the hip bone. And then it comes down and it kind of joins up with these two, call them the psoas muscles. They connect to these uh, transverse processes as well as parts of the body of the lumbar vertebrae. And then it kind of comes down. You can see that big meaty part comes down and it, it connects and joins up with the uh, iliacus muscle into one spot, into that lesser trochanter, which is a little tiny bump. Uh, on the femur. This is the greater trochanter out here, the lesser trochanter is a little smaller in here. So um, this muscle uh, does a lot with uh, movement of um, kind of like hip rotation. So if I, uh, these are the anchor spots here. This is the movable part here. So if I pull these strings, it's gonna bring, it's gonna cause hip flexion, maybe a little bit of hip rotation. So this muscle does a lot when it comes to walking and sitting uh, and any type of movement of the femur, right? The femur does all kinds of movements. So these guys here uh, help with a lot of that. And unfortunately, uh, the sciatic nerve uh, comes off of this area. Um, there's another muscle in here called the piriformis that, again, if you're a PTA or orthopedic, you'll deal with that one a lot too. Piriformis comes down. So we've got this big group of muscles in, in this lower back, kind of anterior lower back area that oftentimes uh, have uh, excess um, fiber fibrosis or there may be some trigger points or uh, there may be some excess tension that's going to be putting pressure on the sciatic nerve and, and inhibiting flow and causing all kinds of potential low back and uh, hip uh, and leg issues. So uh, that anyway, that's what's going on there. This also happens to be uh, the, the uh, tenderloin. This is a filet mignon of the cow, um, the psoas muscle. And then uh, you can see uh, if you've ever had filet mignon it, or mignon, it's a um, it's kind of a round piece of meat, right? It's not real big or it's not a big diameter necessarily, but it's fairly circular and they're usually cut pretty thick. And what they do when they butcher the cow, they remove this, this whole musculature area. And uh, so you get the sirloin steak, um, that's gonna be the iliacus, and then uh, the filet mignon, and sometimes you get the double, right? You'll get the, the round piece with the sirloin, you'll get that, that nice cut. Um, that, that's called, I think, like a porterhouse or something. That's got a whole nother name to it. Um, but anyway, uh, they'll take the psoas out and then they chop it up and get like maybe four to 10 little filet mignons or mignons out of that. So it's a, it's a tubular muscle. So going to our cow talk and our animal talk, our livestock talk, um, on a cow that's hunched over walking on all fours, the psoas muscle is going to be a major muscle that's going to contract and pull their back legs forward. So as the cow's walking and their back legs are coming forward, it's the psoas muscle that's pulling those legs forward. Again, goes back to the free range meat versus the standing around in a, in a pen with everybody else and not moving around, uh, staying on cement likely, and not getting much activity meat. So more or less kind of your, your big um, kind of mass producing farms versus your smaller farms that allow their cows to get some fresh air, right? And graze and walk around. That's the meat you want. You want meat from a cow that's had some exercise to it. And, and I don't, I'm not preparing for uh, Olympiads or anything, but a cow that's actually walking 
is good. Cows that don't walk, they stand all day on cement. Um, they're going to have sinewy, just meat is going to be kind of fatty, not a lot of leanness to it. And it's going to be, you're going to have smaller uh, soas. So anyway, that's what's going on there. Let's jump into uh, the anterior aspects of the thigh. There are several muscles here, but we're going to take them as a group. The first group, we're going to step over to the right side uh, illustration. This whole group is, is what we call the adductor with a D, double D, A-D-D. -D. You can see it right here, adductor brevis longus magnus, and then a couple others, pectineus and gracilis. You don't need to know these specifics. Just know that this group on the inner thigh area, what kind of the groin area. Uh, so if you get a pulled groin or you hear about a pulled groin, it's oftentimes either the pectineus uh, or the gracilis that gets pulled. Notice the gracilis, uh, come, they, they all kind of anchor right up here or, or around the pubic bone. And the gracilis is most medial and it actually comes all the way down uh, pretty far to the tibia. So um, that's usually the groin muscle that gets pulled. Now, the gracilis, so just know this whole group is the adductor group. And so uh, if they adduct, that means they bring the legs closer together. They bring the knees together. So, um, so the movable part is going to be the medial portion of the femur, and the anchor is going to be up here on the pubic bone primarily. Okay. And you can see them uh, make an appearance over here. So just know those as the adductor group. Uh, we have a big batch of muscles over here. This first one is a standalone muscle. It's the longest muscle of the body. It's called the sartorius. Okay, the sartorius. I'm going to get my pointer. That might be better. Here we go. Sartorius muscle. And that is this big muscle here. It's the longest muscle of the body. So you may want to note that sartorius, longest muscle in the body. It starts at the front or anterior portion of your pelvic uh, bones. So at that point on your hips at the front, that's where that's going to start. And then it travels, that's its uh, anchor site or origin. And then it travels uh, across kind of in an oblique manner from the lateral portion, travels down toward the medial portion of your knee region, all the way down and plugs in onto the tibia, kind of around the plateau of the, the medial portion of the tibia. So the action of that sartorius muscle, remember action is shortening the fibers and getting the insertion pulled up to meet the origin. So what this is called is the sartorius, which means a tailor. Most of you probably don't know what a tailor is. I barely do. Um, and I'm old. So uh, a tailor has, is someone who mends clothing or makes clothing. Um, so they cross their legs a lot, apparently. So um, if you bring your, if you, bring your leg and put your lateral portion of your ankle bone up onto your other leg and sit with your leg crossed and you sit like this and then cross your leg over like that. That muscle is what accomplishes that action. So when you're crossing your leg, um, sartorius does that longest muscle in the body all right let's move on from it uh, the next batch on the anterior thigh uh, region is called the quad recepts group so quad meaning four recepts meaning four heads but four origin heads four muscles actually as well um, so the largest, it's probably one of the larger, more powerful muscle groups. Uh, the first muscle uh, that we usually do for the quadriceps is the largest uh, one. It's also the, the one that goes right down the middle. We call it the rectus femoris. Rectus femoris makes the femur uh, erect. So um, that particular one is going to enable the entire leg to straighten out. The whole quadriceps group uh, is going to perform the action of straightening out the leg or extending uh, the shin. So the whole quadriceps group is actually going to insert 
down onto uh, what we call the tibial tuberosity. It's a, a bumpy uh, kind of protrusion uh, right on the, the anterior uh, proximal surface uh, or area of the tibia. So the quadriceps all kind of bundle together uh, and, and the tendon is sheathed uh, that, that they all bundle together and is going to contain the patella. So you can kind of see the patella involved with that. Okay. So again, if I want to extend my leg out, uh, then the quadriceps are performing that action. So we've got uh, rectus femoris, and then we have uh, three vastus muscles. Vast means uh, expansive. A vast, the vast open spaces. So vastus implies that it's a pretty vast muscle. It's probably pretty long too. Uh, so vastus medialis tells us it's a medial portion. Vastus lateralis tells us it's the lateral portion. So when you when you're viewing the quadriceps or the thighs, the th three out of the four are palpable. Okay, so if, if you so palpating the front of your thigh, you can right down the middle is going to be the rectus femoris. Now, if you go a little bit medial toward kind of the medial part of your your knees, there, there's a kind of a a, a big uh, uh, muscular blob there. That's the vastus medialis. The medialis is medial, but it's also meti with a t, metiest. It's the mediest portion of that chunk of, of, of quadriceps that's, again, on the kind of the medial distal area of your, your thigh area, your thigh bone or your femur. Okay, so, and then lateralis is going to be the, the outside or lateral portions of the, of the quadriceps or of the thigh area. Okay, vastus lateralis. The fourth one is actually underneath all of this. So I'd have to, to snip this and then peel all of these back, and we would see the fourth quadriceps muscle. They call it intermedius vastus intermedius. So it just means it's between these other two. So lateralis, medialis, intermedius, and then on top of all of them is rectus femoris. So those are the main muscles really of the thigh. The quadriceps group, the ad, so three things, quadriceps group, adductor group, sartorius. Okay. Now we've got a couple little, there's that psoas and the iliacus. You can kind of see those up there. Okay. We'll talk about these two in just a few minutes. Okay. These, this is the adductor group. All right, let's look at the gluteal group. We do have three gluteal muscles on each side. We have the, the largest, most superficial is the gluteus maximus. Okay. If we go right underneath the gluteus maximus, we're going to see the gluteus medius. We also can see that the gluteus medius is a little bit anterior. Okay. So notice gluteus medius has more of an origin on the iliac crest, whereas gluteus maximus has some origin on the iliac crest, but a lot of it is going to be back here on that, near that SI joint or the sacroiliac joint as well as the coccyx. So if you have gluteus maximus issues, you know, there could, or stress or strain, uh, it can lead to some kind of soreness uh, down in the tailbone area. Okay, well, all three of these come out to the greater trochanter. All three of them are gonna do uh, abduction of the hip. So the, 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 this gluteus medius especially, that is, is a large muscle. That's kind of like your hip pocket muscle. You can palpate the gluteus medius. The maximus is in the back. If you come just a little bit forward and on the most, light, like, like, the, like the true sides of your hips, that's gluteus medius. Okay. Gluteus medius uh, is kind of like the deltoid of the legs. Deltoid up here, remember, does this. Gluteus medius down on the legs is going to do the same thing, abduct the legs. Okay. Gluteus medius, and then minimus is underneath everything, and, and it's just a small muscle. And, and again, all three of these together are going to help with some uh, with the gluteus maximus, we're actually going to get some posterior action because it does a little more of a posterior muscle. Um, so we might get some uh, 
uh, I guess like posterior, um, that would be like a hip uh, extension. So when we're sitting, our hips are in hip flexion, but when I put my leg way back, that's called hip extension or even hip hyperextension. So we would see a little bit of that with the gluteus maximus certainly. And then the, the other two are gonna do more abduction of the hip. Gluteus medius, opposite side, when I take a step forward, this is FYI factoid, when I walk forward, when, when my left leg moves forward and my right leg is stationary, the gluteus medius of my right leg is generating uh, roughly twice my body weight, uh, sometimes even more, maybe up to four times your body weight. Uh, to keep your pelvis stable. So the gluteus medius is kind of like a fixator muscle for, uh, for the opposite side gluteus medius is a fixator when, uh, when we have hip flexion and, and, and walking or movement of the opposite leg. So when one leg's coming forward, the gluteus medius of the other leg is, is stabilizing and contracting uh, to, uh, to kind of fixate uh, the whole pelvic girdle because the idea is if I walk forward the pelvis is the origin for all of those muscles and so we need it to be stable otherwise it, it'll do one of these numbers so the gluteus medius creates about twice as much pounds of, of force of your body weight so you know through I weigh a lot so it generates a lot of force I'm probably 200 and 20 pounds. So my gluteus medius has to generate about 400, 450 pounds of force uh, every time I take a step forward. So, um, so sedentary lifestyle is bad is what I'm getting at because we don't want these muscles to atrophy, um, waste away. We go to use them and our, our pelvis, our whole hip complex. We, we see a lot of overweight and obese people. They have a hard time walking normally, lifting their leg forward, setting it down, lifting the other leg forward, setting it down, and so on. So we do see a lot of shuffling uh, for, for overweight people. A lot of times their, their feet are, are a little bit bowed out and they do more of like a shuffle because again, they, their gluteus medius is only used to generating a, a certain amount of force. If their normal weight is, is 150 pounds, their gluteus medius is set point for for stabilizing the hips when I walk is going to be 300 pounds. If I normally weigh 150, they have to generate 300 pounds each. If I increase my weight to 250 pounds, so I gain 100 pounds, now I have to ask gluteus medius to generate 500 pounds of force. And they're only used to generating 300 pounds of force. So they just won't, they can't. So that excess weight on our bodies causes more of a, a more difficulty with proper gait and range of motion of the hips. And then that leads to a whole bunch of other issues with, with uh, the vertebral column and the lower back and the nerves that are coming off. And then that leads to pain and then they end up with chronic pain and they don't want to do any activity because they're in pain, even though the sedentary lifestyle is what probably led to uh, different set points. And then we've got nerve issues and inflammation and on and on and on. And then that can affect, we're going to see later on this semester and next semester in physiology, is that all these nerves are feeding your internal organs. So if we've got problems with the vertebral column and, and posture and sedentary and, and, and all kinds of things, all of that electricity that's coming off and going to the organs is compromised. And so then we end up seeing more diabetes, not just, be, not just because of the consumption, but because of, of the physiology of the body and the stress that's being placed on the body and how the body handles glucose and consumes glucose uh, internally. Um, so again, oxygen, glucose, we need those to be at optimum levels so we can avoid uh, a lot of these chronic conditions that we have. All right, so anyway, hamstrings group, um, we see three hamstring muscles. They're going to be the posterior group. These are the antagonists to the quadriceps. So quadriceps in the front create front movements, anterior movements. Hamstrings in the back create posterior movements.
Okay? These are the antagonists of one another. Okay? The three hamstrings are called biceps femoris. So we've seen biceps brachii. Now we see biceps femoris. It's probably the largest of the three. And it's going to have more or less a, a uh, uh, lateral insertion down on the fibula or the fibular head. And then we have what's called the semitendinosus and semimembranosus muscles. Okay, so semitendinosus is, and membranosus are both going to be medial. You can palpate, it's kind of sensitive, but that we call it the popliteal or popliteal area behind the knee. It's a lot of nerve back there, a lot of blood flow back there, but it, so it is a little sensitive. But there are two large ligament, or two large tendons that you can palpate back there two large tendons. The medial tendon is what we call, and if you, if you grab it and you follow it backwards or follow it, or if you grab it from the back and you follow it up uh, approximately, you can feel, you're feeling the semitendinosus muscle. And just a little bit medial of that is a smaller muscle called the semimembranosus. Okay? And if you go to the lateral tendon behind your knee, that lateral tendon, if you grab it and kind of move up toward the back of your thigh, it stays kind of lateral, that's the biceps femoris. Okay, so you can palpate those. Biceps femoris, what's the biceps up here do? Flexion of the elbow. What's the biceps down there do? It's going to do flexion of the knee. Okay, so biceps femoris. Semitendinosus, large tendon, uh, semimembranosus, more membranous, and, and a little more medial. They're both pretty equally medial, though, I would say. Okay, it's hamstrings. And then again, you can see the gluteus maximus being uh, more of a posterior muscle, gluteus medius, more of a lateral uh, muscle. Oh, I wanted to mention back here. Uh, this muscle and this, these two things here, um, we can kind of see a, a little bit of a triangle here. Remember that sartorius, that big muscle that travels from, from the point of your hip all the way down to your tibia, goes across the front of your, your thigh. Well, going the other way, so if you start at that point and you go posterior and lateral a little bit, there's a, a big chunk of muscle right there called the TFL. We just abbreviate it. Um, tensor fascia latte. Um, we're not worried about this too much. Just know it's the TFL, tensor fascia latte. Of all the muscles we're studying, if that one gets lost in the shuffle when you're in your minds, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> You've got plenty to know. All right. IT band, iliotibial tract or IT tract. That basically brings, so it goes, the name of it tells you a lot, right? Iliotibial. So it goes from the ilium down to the tibia. Okay. And that is a band of connective tissue that you can palpate, you can, it, it brings your quadriceps and your hamstrings together on the lateral side of your femur. So your quads and hamstrings are connected with fascia. There's a band of tissue that runs all along the side uh, or the lateral side of your thigh called uh, the IT band, iliotibial band. It's a sensitive uh, spot. All right, we're pretty much done. Uh, and then I'll sign off and let you guys get to work. All right, so we've got uh, the lower leg. There's really just a couple of muscles uh, that you need to know. The first one is out front. We call it the, the name of the muscle tells us a lot about it. Tibialis anterior, so the front of the tibia, okay? tibialis anterior. That's your shin muscle. This is the shin splints muscle. This muscle is going to perform the action of, of what we call dorsiflexion. So it's going to bring your toes towards your face. You can see uh, several uh, tendons down here off of the tibialis anterior, but particularly in the, uh, the big toe. If you point the big toe towards your nose, you can, if, you, if you palpate the front of your shin and then point your big toe up to the sky, you can feel that pop out. Bloop, pops right out. 
Okay, so if you if you sit back or, or or go back on your heels and point your toes up to the sky, you can feel the tibialis anterior pop out. Now, if you put your hand or palpate the back of your of your calf your calf area, and you point your toes down toward the floor like you're standing on your tiptoes, now you're you're activating the gastrocnemius, which is the calf muscle group. Gastro means belly, so it's got big bellies there. Gastrocnemius, that's your calf muscle, and notice too, it comes in and it has a large tendon, you guys have probably all heard of, the Achilles tendon, also known as the calcaneal tendon, right? The Achilles tendon, so um, the uh, insertion or the movable part of the, of the uh, calf muscle or the gastrocnemius is the calcaneus or heel bone. So when, I, and the, again, the origin is going to be up here on the condyles of the femur. So if I bring uh, insertion up towards origin, it's going to point the toes downward, right? We call that plantar flexion. Okay. The Achilles tendon. It's called that in Greek mythology, the, the hero Achilles uh, basically was dipped into uh, a pool of invincibility water, the pond of invincibility. Okay? And, and he, he couldn't just dive in and jump out. He had to get dipped in by one of the gods. I don't know who, I don't remember. That's been a long time ago. Uh, probably... Zeus or somebody, uh, but somebody, Zeus, will say, picked up Achilles uh, by the, that area, by the calcaneal tendons, and dipped the entire body, pulled him out, and uh, the area where he didn't get exposed to uh, was uh, the only way that Achilles was able to be. It was his weak spot. Right, so they call that your Achilles heel is the weak spot uh, of who you are. Yeah, he was a baby. Oh, his mom. Thank you, Eduardo. See, I knew somebody would know uh, what's going on. But yeah, okay. So, and I don't know who his mom was. It could have been Hera. It could have been or Hera. I I really don't know. Uh, but yeah, Zeus got dipped, and his ankles didn't quite get dipped. So uh, that when he was older fighting they found out what his weakness was and that's what it was so uh, appreciate that eduardo i'm not a uh, big uh, super knowledgeable about mythology but i know just enough to to tell you uh, where that word achilles comes from that's probably about it um and of course thor right we all know thor and uh, um yeah Mjolnir and the hammer and all that good stuff, right? All right. So anyway, soleus. That's soleus means flat. Okay? Soleus. So just under the gastrocnemius is a flat muscle called the soleus. Okay. Basically, it, it kind of like a synergist with the gastrocnemius. They're practically. Uh, they're practically doing the same thing. It's almost one muscle, but we do see different fiber direction a little bit with the soleus and we do see a separation of fascia. So we do know it is slightly different. So gastrocnemius soleus and then tibialis anterior. The only other one you might see is what we call the fibularis longus. If it's a fibularis muscle, it's going to be on the fibular side, which is the lateral portion of the lower leg. So fibularis longus comes out here. That helps, uh, and it kind of comes down uh, to the lateral portion uh, of the tarsals. So it's going to do some uh, what we call the eversion. Okay, so if I shorten the, the fibularis longus, it'll evert my feet just a little bit. So um, that one might pop up too uh, occasionally. But again, the name of it tells you, at the very least, where it's located. That's it. Posture, we've talked about that extensively. I don't need to go into that. I do want to mention, too, that, again, posture is more than just feeling good and, and 
feeling like you're uh, more confident, but it also improves blood flow. It improves nerve flow. Um, and it helps with bone density uh, and maintaining bone density and homeostasis. We'll look at a nerve uh, term in a couple of weeks called proprio, oh, pardon me, proprioception. Proprioception is your body's ability to kind of understand where it is in space. So if you close your eyes and, and hold your, you can uh, spin around and have, still have your eyes closed, you can still have a pretty good idea where I know where my nose is. It's right there. I know where my chin is. It's right there. So my shoulder is here. So even without vision, I can know that I'm standing upright. I can know that I'm sitting down. I know that I'm laying down. I know that I'm falling. Whatever it might be, my my nervous system is working in a in a kind of a, an involuntary, almost an unconscious way to enable us to not be pushed down by gravity in essence. So we so muscles, my point is as I conclude, muscle actions are not kind of an all or nothing thing. They're not completely voluntary. There's 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 definitely especially proprioception and posture. There there are muscles that are that are working constantly to to help us maintain uh, our body positions. And and again, if we're sedentary or if we're not doing much of anything for whatever reason, then we, we do still retain our proprioception, but uh, some of our postural aspects are different and we have new set points. And so the proprioception does change uh, slightly, uh, but again, you can, uh, you can activate, you can retrain your posture muscles to, without having to lift weights, pump iron, go to the gym, do all of these things. These are just at home conscious awareness of where my shoulders are, where my hips are, where my knees are, where my ankles are. If, if everything's wha all wacky, then that again leads to potential uh, other issues. So that's it for today. You guys have plenty to do. Um, I, like I stated at the beginning, we have some uh, week five uh, or unit five skeletal system portfolio assignments to grade. And you have, there's some of you still have them to turn in, but for the most part, uh, I, I think you you guys are, are staying on, on task pretty well. And again, this muscle uh, unit is not due next week. It's due in two weeks. We will, however, start uh, in on uh, a new unit um, next week. So it'll, it'll either be endocrine system or nervous system. I'm still kind of juggling things uh, around as we move forward. But uh, regardless, uh, my goal is also to get all, uh, all of the padlets out there for you to do for the rest of the semester and get uh, the rest of the assignments. Basically, just get the rest of the semester open and available to you uh, in Blackboard uh, as next week approaches, which believe it or not is already week eight, uh, I believe next week out of about 14 or 15 weeks. So if you don't have any questions, then, then I'll leave you and uh, have a great day. Uh, and if again, this weekend, if you have any